Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I got a last minute interview this morning with Scott Waring from Elucidation. Scott, it's great to finally mm. have you on here, man. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks. This is kind of just like a random on a whim thing. You know, I was um, talking a lot about testing with the control board. I thought, you know, I'm going to holler at Scott. Excellent. I appreciate cool. that. Uh, would you um, would you mind? I start every guest off with a little bit I call the five minute life story. Give us a little bit about your your background. You could actually take ten. Your background was fascinating. Uh, well, it's it's long. It's been a long long life for sure. Um, so I I, uh, I was always interested in biology, and that's kind of what I went to ended up going to school for. I thought about doing theater for a while, but. Um, <laughs> didn't really seem to pay the bills and so I went into biology and unfortunately that's kind of the same situation here <laughs> so um I uh um yeah so I, I followed this girl in North Carolina and uh didn't didn't work out for us but I ended up having a great uh experience in Asheville went to UNC Asheville and got my bachelor's degree there um, while I was there, I met my first wife and had my first son. And um, at that point, I got really motivated to do something else. And so I went to grad school for entomology at University of Florida, um, working on uh, agricultural IPM. So controlling pests with natural enemies, uh, predator bugs and um, pathogens like fungi, uh, bacterial extracts, that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a really interesting um, experience. And so I wanted to keep going. And um, I moved back to Asheville, did some teaching for a while, bought a house, um, planned on staying there for a while. And then uh, I ended up meeting um, my second wife and we had trailed children and I ended up uh, relocating to Raleigh, uh, North Carolina and worked at UNC Chapel Hill in uh, plant disease ecology lab, um, managed that lab uh, for Dr. Charles Mitchell for a while, and um, then got a, a fellowship to go overseas to New Zealand to do my PhD in um, invasive species ecology uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand, and did that for several years, uh, a lot of backpacking in the wilderness, which was absolutely horrible. Um, it was it was a great experience, um, and I I managed to um, to make it happen, and then came back and worked in the um, the uh, Carolina Center for Genome Sciences, working on uh, human cancer genome atlas, doing a lot of genomic sequencing of cancer tissue and healthy tissue, and that um, was a national. Uh, Institute of Health project, and they funded that to kind of get a, a baseline reading on uh, what healthy tissue looks like versus uh, cancerous tissue, which cancer is a number of mutations in a cell that occur. Uh, one of them is like a doesn't it fails to turn off the cell division, and so that's why you get this rapid tumor growth. And so we basically sequenced the the areas in the genome where those mutations occurred and caused the cancers. Um, and then I got more into some other projects that weren't human-based, so plants and birds and ants and <clears throat> Daphnia. And um, then um, I, uh, I heard from a friend that Steep Hill Labs in Berkeley, California was doing um, sequencing of the cannabis genome using the same equipment that we were using at UNC, um, which is a rare, it was a small user group at the time. So um, pretty much you, we were aware of everybody that had that machine. Um, and so I reached out um, to, uh, the fellow who was running the genetics program at Steep Hill and told him I was really interested in um, working in cannabis genetics. And so we kept in touch for a year and then they didn't really have any funding for 
uh, the genetics team, but they needed to hire somebody to open a cannabis testing lab in Albuquerque. So I applied for the job and they hired me and I moved out to Albuquerque and opened Steep Hill, New Mexico. Um, and it was, uh, man, New Mexico is just an amazing place. It was a uh, completely different than I've ever lived anywhere before. And it was great. And, uh, Everything was going well. And then um, right before the end of the year, the uh, the company was sold to somebody else. And um, they, in a short amount of time, a lot of things changed from uh, a, a lab, like a, a national lab to a franchise-based model. And um, anyway, I was out of a job and in New Mexico for a while. And so I tried to do consulting for different cannabis businesses and, and actually ended up learning quite a bit just by doing that, going in and uh, helping, you know, once they were, everybody knew how to grow cannabis. They knew how to do extraction stuff, but the uh, important part of like sanitation and hygiene and organization and planning and, um, just the logistics of it all was not going well for them. So um, I stepped in and tried to help them clean it up a little bit, clean it up a little bit more and make it more efficient. Um, and uh, so I ended up doing that for them and worked at a, another lab in Santa Fe, trying to help them get their HPLC going. Um, and then I got the um, offer for the job here in Vermont, which um, was exciting because my parents at the time, they lived here in South Hero. My mom still lives here. So I uh, jumped at the opportunity and moved back to Vermont. And um, yeah, I took the job at the dispensary. We worked there for a year and a half. Um, and then we parted ways and I went and worked for um, Joe Bedard at the Vermont Hemp Company, and then I went and helped Northeast Hemp Processing, uh, no, sorry, Northeast Hemp Commodities down in, um, uh, I guess they're in Middlebury now, um, and then um, Northeast Processing, um, and a couple other small places, um, just getting, helping them get their lab up and running, and plants in the ground and that sort of stuff, make, making a plan. It's um, been very interesting. We have a, a lot of interesting people in our industry. And now you mentioned Steep Hill Labs. I, I feel like they are also starting a lab here in Vermont. Is that true? Yes, they are. Um, and they've, like I said, they went to a franchise model. And so I'm not sure exactly. I, I understand the person that has that is starting a lab was associated with Autumn Harp, but I don't know too much about the details of the deal, but I do know that they, they franchise out and um, basically pay a, a licensing fee and then they provide you with IP that helps you, you know, you have the SOPs and everything that you need for the state to be compliant. And then they also have all the analytical testing equipment and, and analysis um, know how to help people with their their lab. So they're basically just licensing their their name or something. Yeah, their name and their IP. Yep. Okay, I'm kind of dumb at things like that. So a lot of things have changed. So you know, it, it, it happens fast. And but uh, that was kind of the big change that happened when I was with them. And now uh, I think it's been sold again. And so the, each each of the each of the different license holders is a fran franchisee, but I think the, f the one in Pennsylvania is held separately somehow, and they're going to, I don't know what they're doing with their licensing, but it's a, it's a interesting like arrangements that were made between people, and um, I just, I don't know all the details, but me either, but I'd sure like to because, boy, I, I asked the control board if they were going to be allowed to sell the licenses, and they said no. You know, I'd be allowed to sell licenses anymore, but that raises a question of like, all right, well, how did the last five get sold? You know, uh huh. 
But they're they're just testing. They're just analytical testing. So they only open up a lab and do, uh, you know, potency and microbial, uh, heavy metal testing, that sort of stuff. So they're not they're not selling anything. They'll just be testing the products that are. Oh no! I meant like they could sell their license off to another company. You know, um, oh right, say no explicitly to, um, you know, but. <clears throat> They have this rule about one entity, one license type per entity. And there seems to be some confusion about what an, an entity actually is, you know, like, you know, like oh, what, if a, what if a husband and wife like wanted to each start a lab, you know, like, is that one entity? Cause they're married or like, say, um, I'm going to use Shane Lynn as an example. Like he just got fired from the board of slang. Like what if he now wanted to go out and sort of um, just acquire or what if they fired him just so that he could go out and get another license things like that you know which um <clears throat> yeah curious yeah no me too and like a lot of that stuff is not clear um because i i i mean completely and honestly there's a, a somebody else an attorney friend of mine told me that the a husband and wife was interested in getting a mixed mixed use permit um and they weren't they wanted to grow outdoor but they wanted to grow indoor and the rule is they have to be on the same property but these were actually two separate locations but they weren't allowed to do that because of their relationship and okay yeah so there are some some restrictions on on the licensing and how many you can have but um and then like for the mixed use they like I, I, we had um, a client that had a nice situation lined up with a farm and a um, an indoor grow space, but they they got denied the license because they were you know a mile away from each other. Huh. Yeah. Um. Interesting. This is gonna it's gonna take a while to peel back that onion, but um, how how were the original um, lab licenses? um awarded was there a control board for like the medical um dispensaries when they started doing the retail no there was nothing it was all voluntary um and uh so medical still does not have any requirements to uh as far as testing goes except for thc and cbd so there's no microbial testing, there's no heavy metal testing, there's no, um, you know, just requirement for a visual test. The only thing they have to report is THC and CBD. And um, yeah, so like I think the recreational market has that happening now where they're evolving the test regulations and who's gonna be doing the testing, but there is nothing for the medical program there's no requirements except for the cannabinoids. Um, now I saw maybe not in the rules, but I I saw some uh, we'll call it guidance here from the CCB. I'm trying to pull it up real quick. Um, I've been in cahoots with a guy who's also trying to start a lab, and we've got um, he sent me here the actionable limits, um, testing laboratory action limits and parameters guidance. So not legislation, but this is from the control board and they have some guidance here regarding um, certain types of heavy metals for sure. Um, and then these look like pesticides, oh, those are solvents. And then we got some pesticides and things like that. Um, but for sure that's not um, in the law. But it, no, it's um, not. But it's gonna um, be for retail. Is it? Yeah, it will be for retail. But I think the, the no, there's not a whole lot going on with the medical program now because it was, I mean, it's under the state police for one. So, you know, the focus is not so much on safety and quality as it is about compliance. So I think that's kind of one <laughs> that's kind of off to a bad start there for, I mean, if you're like a medical patient and really interested in controlling uh, you know, pathogens. Sure. Yeah. And I think the guidance from the state, and I don't, I'm not positive of this, but states tend to borrow guidance from other states. And yeah, the I remember when Massachusetts 
first issued their guidance for heavy metals, um, it was really stringent at a very low level. And there are people who could just couldn't measure that low, like their equipment. Oh, wow. That's wasn't sure. that sensitive. So I think they've revised that since then because you know, there's a whole lot of hot tests. But uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a serious consideration. Like you want people to have access to safe medicine and you want them to be able to afford it, but you have, you know, a certain amount of testing that you have to do in order to ensure that it's uh, safe. But like who pays for that? And so it's it's kind of like a it is a, a bit of a balance. And I don't know if a committee is necessarily the best way to do it. Um, I mean, like a, a a committee like in in the legislature. Like I feel like a lot of legislators as might as smart as they are and as hardworking as they are, they just don't know this stuff. And so I feel a lot of people are working with outdated information or a lack of information and it's hard to um it's hard to get consensus on anything but um on something like this where there's not really a standard for uh, like a national standard or uh, sure and that is um that is something i was hoping we could dive into for sure because i've asked um julie and kyle from the control board and obviously uh, like you said about the legislature, like a lot of them just don't know this stuff. And quite frankly, you need a goddamn PhD to understand some of this stuff. Um, it's not easy. Um, I have some friends that went to school for biotech and biochemistry, and that shit is just so far over my head. I mean, I, I understand the basics of lab procedures and keeping shit clean, but like, you know, um, I don't know how to calibrate those machines. I don't know how to set benchmarks. I don't know. Um, you know, how to troubleshoot if there's something wrong with the result, you know, is it the equipment? Was it me? Um, and I, I feel like this is a subject that has not gotten enough attention. Um, and it's kind of like the last step in the whole process here. Um, and I was, I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about how, how you calibrate these machines. First of all, what techniques are you using to um, do your testing? And, you know, how, how do you maintain these machines? Great question there. Um, so it's a, I guess start, we'll start off with the potency testing. So testing for cannabinoids. Um, there's a couple different methods that you can use. The most common is the high pressure liquid chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography. Um, and if you've ever, um, done experiment, I don't know, but I think it's common in science classrooms, but you, you take some leaves and you grind them up in ethanol and you put them in a glass and then you take like a paper towel and stick it in there. And as the liquid wicks up different um, uh, pigments will go at different rates. So you'll have the heavy dark green one at the bottom and the light yellow pigments, the anthocyanins would be going a lot faster. And so you'll have these bands of color across the paper towel. It's basically that, but it happens inside of a machine with, um, uh, so the HPLC, you'll do a preparation of um, a little bit of bud in ethanol and you mix it up really well. And then you dilute that even further. So it's a very, um, a very dilute solution of whatever's in there. But each time you cut it, it's with a like mathematically, like if you cut it with uh, 10 milliliters of solution and you cut it with 90 of ethanol, then you have 10% solution of the original stuff. And so going back, that's going to be important going back and doing the measurement. But going forward, you put put this little vial of test material in there and the machines now have auto samplers. So you don't have to inject it by hand like you used to. They'll stick a needle in this container, take out a small amount, like five microliters, and then put it straight into the ejector. It sends it through a, a tube along with mobile phase. So usually like 
acetonitrile. Or it's just like the liquid that carries it through the tube. Um, and then it hits the column and the column looks a lot like a ballpoint pen, maybe a little bit bigger. It's a cylinder, like a skinny cylinder and it's packed with very expensive sand. Um, and so the solution moves through that and like it does on a paper towel, the heavier molecules or the more charged molecules will move slower. The lighter molecules and that are, that are not charged, um, not, not polar, uh, will move through faster. And so you have basically these things moving through at a given time. And when they come out, the detector will see these compounds and the amount of light that is absorbed is recorded and you get what's called a peak. And the computer determines that when this, the absorbance goes down, there's a peak, there's a compound there. And so that's basically what the machine does. In order to calibrate that, you take known standards from somebody who makes them a, a lab, like um, Pennsylvania, uh, State College Pennsylvania apparently has a lot of chromatography people around there. Cerulean was who we got ours from, but uh, like uh, it would be a thousand um, micrograms of THC in methanol or a thousand micrograms of CBD in methanol. So you would know what the concentration is. You'd create a vial, you'd send it through the machine, the machine would read it. And given that peak, you would assign the amount to how much or how high that peak is. So you, you know that that peak is gonna be like 500 microliters because you diluted it to 500 microliters. So when you go send through your, your unknown compounds, depending on how high or how it relates to that, the size of that peak, then you know about how much of that compound is in there. And there's different things that can mess that up. Like chocolate um, is a really hard matrix to tease out. So that Alpha, will, huh? yeah. Why is, um, why is that? Uh, so food, food matrices in general are a little tricky to, to get cleaned out, to get the, uh, um, the cannabinoids out without the sugars or the, um, the other compounds in the food. Um, and chocolate, I think it's, it might be something to do with the pH and the, the fact that it's just so uh, hard to get out. I don't know, but I've hmm, interesting. It's uh, they create these different packages for um, cleaning out food products so that you can get the cannabinoids um, in in like the the right. Uh, concentrations but it has been a real big challenge for edibles to to get the uh, the potencies correct on those yeah and you know what else it's interesting you mentioned that because i had a woman um tell me about some trouble that she had with a lab um where she makes these um she said they're like um peppermint patties and the outside is covered with chocolate which doesn't have any weed in it and the inside with the peppermint, that's where all the THC is at. So she said she sent it to this lab and really the way that they were cutting up their samples to test it or whatever, was it's not like they ground the whole thing up and then like measure it. She said, the way she described it was basically like they took a weird slice out of it, which didn't give an accurate representation. So like, how do you, how do you go about accurately testing something like that? That's a great question. Um, and I think that the, the labs around are struggling because there is not really a standard. Everybody has their method or a method that they borrowed from somebody. Um, my, the way I was taught was that uh, you want to try to get the best sample possible. So you take as, you know, you can't take the entire population you'd have to take a sample from it so like maybe if it's a, a dozen peppermint patties you take one and thoroughly blend it or you know maybe two in this case if you have because the thing with in cannabis edibles is mixing and blending and 
um, just the formulation is really tricky for a lot of people because you'll end up with pockets of high doses and pockets of low dose. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a science in itself, the formulation. Sure. Um, but if you get a package of 12 peppermint patties, they could all be different based on how they were formulated. So to your point in a lab, you want to, you know, ideally it'd be great to just measure everything, but that's impractical. So you have to kind of create some sort of method to subsample and figure out using your best um, methods to apply that to the entire package. Um, now, so let me ask you, what if, what if you wanted to say we wanted to test something not at say we wanted to test flour, like say you had a, a thousand pounds of flour and you want to send that to a lab, how much of that would you have to get tested? Or like if you were to test it, if you wanted to get an accurate sample from that, how would you acquire that and, and test it? So the American Botanical Pharmacopoeia has the, um, the has a well regarded procedure for that, and it um, is basically taking samples. Well, taking a sample like a large sample, and then taking sub samples from that sample from multiple different locations. And I know they try to do this with the testing for cannabis too, like taking location, like planet bits off of different parts of the plant. Now they want to do just an axial bud, but, you know, playing around with that a little bit, um, the States have been, have been doing that. And um, so like with flower, um, every lab is different they will add ask for different amounts so like uh going back to uh, going back to new mexico every five pounds was considered a batch so you had to test every five pounds i don't know if they've just i don't as far as i know they haven't defined a batch in vermont uh, unless it's like a a field of the same strain is what i think it is right now um but I, you know, the, obviously, the more testing you do, the better your data is going to be. Um, the downside of that is it costs like a hundred bucks per pop to do your testing. Um, so, the people in the lab, I think, have a different idea of what. This is something I've come up with a lot is like what are what are best practices what's what's realistic and affordable um and where is the middle ground on that and so you want to do as much testing as possible but vermont says you only have to do one test for your whole field of um do dos or whatever and so that's that's what you do um why i'm not you... sure if i've seen anything definitive about how like how much you need to send in is it you know based yeah. on how much based on what license type you have um i have to look into that more but please. yeah i think at one point in time they were talking about sending um you know the cannabis control board technician people out to do the sampling of the field themselves so they would uh i, I know they were doing that for hemp uh and they had like a process where they would walk in like a, a hourglass shape in your in your field so like cross transect and then around the end and cross another cross transect and across the end and then just kind of create a composite sample a little bit of each plant sure. mix it all up real good and then test that and then depending on where the cannabinoids land that's kind of how it goes yeah um but they don't have the money of the staff and you know like they're being asked to do a lot of stuff with nothing i was gonna um, say they're already processing 600 applications how are they gonna have time to go out to 300 grows and take samples and they don't have the <laughs> they don't really have the oversight manpower for that kind of operation it seems yeah and i think some of that is the the disconnect between the legislature and you know the ground and you know, they, this could be a good 
source of income for Vermont, but at the same time, you have to invest in that to get it going. And, uh, you know, if you want to enforce regulations, you need to do that. If you want to enforce. What's the, uh, point? What's the point of having regulations if you can't enforce them? Yeah. I mean, it's like you were saying, you know, they have suggestions, but that, and that's great for people who want to do it right. But there are a lot of people who don't give, who care, you know, they want to just grow their weed and not have anybody mess with them. And so those people, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but that's not the situation we're working with, you know? Right. Well, also I kind of disagree with it in the medical context. Like if you want to oh, grow yeah. your own weed, but, um, you know, I've heard from just a number of people that there has just been all kinds of quality control problems with these medical dispensaries. Um, have you seen any of that? Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about it or anything. Um, they've sent me, uh, well, I guess he doesn't own it anymore, but I've gotten letters from Shane Lynn telling me not to work in cannabis anymore in Vermont. That's all um, right. I could get five other people in here to corroborate. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus here either. No, I, just... I understand. I, I just, I, you know, I, um, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> you can pass <laughs> if you want. I just, it, you know, it's a big concern to me that we're selling potentially moldy weed to people with cancer. Yeah, we're, we're focusing on the safety for the recreational market. And it does, it blows my mind, Kyle, Caleb. I just, I cannot, I cannot understand that. Like it's, that, that should have been step one from, for the medical program, you know, like recreational program. Sure. Yeah. It's a good idea, but medical program, it's like, how, how the hell do you have a medical program when you don't? test the medicine like there that does not happen anywhere yeah and uh i thought i'd ask you because it's also i mean it's been a while since we first talked on the phone way but boy that must have been january february and uh, yeah i still just can't wrap my head around that one i don't either and you can't it's a it's a the public safety thing like they just don't know like you know it's their their thing is we want to prevent diversion. We want to prevent people from selling weed to minors. We want to prevent people from having weed when they don't have a card. It's nothing about like, we want to make sure there's no E. coli in the, in the flowers, or there's no, you know, aspergillus growing on the curing weed or anything like that. It's, those are like the real health concerns. That's how people die from cannabis is from pathogens. It's has not that, from, has that happen. Yeah, yeah. Multiple times. Uh aspergillosis. Um what is like, that? Uh aspergillus is a, a fungus that is common all around. It's in the air. But if you um people if you're immunocompromised and you inhale it directly into your lungs, it's a you know, it could be potentially deadly. Is that, so, is that would that be classified as a mycotoxin? They produce my uh, they produce mycotoxins. There, it is a fungus, so um, it becomes an opportunistic infection. So, you know, you and I can breathe them in, and we have pretty strong immune systems. And I don't. Uh, I have an autoimmune disease. Oh, do you? I have psoriatic arthritis. Yeah, and I take medications that uh, suppress my immune system. Like, um, oh yeah. So, well, yeah. So then you're, you're at risk for sure. Um, but people, people who have compromised immune systems can't fight off infections and especially in a vulnerable place like your lungs. What about smoking mold or powder mildew? I assume that's equally not great for you. Yeah, it's, it's not good for you. Um, it's not an opportunistic pathogen like uh, aspergillosis or um, some, some of the other nastier ones. Uh, but it does cause uh, allergic reactions in people. Um, and you said E. coli. I didn't yeah. realize that uh, you could get E. coli on a, a cannabis plant. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, 
there's different ways. Uh, so like water is one source. Like if you have a contaminated water source from, uh, you know, birds pooping in it or bats. Um, but I think more, more commonly it's people going to the bathroom, not washing their hands or, you know, uh, wiping their hair or face or whatever, and then touching the plant. So, um, it's that easy, huh? Yeah. So yeah, like in the, in your, your groceries, you know, they, they commonly test for, for food that's harvested in the field. And a lot of times you'll get E. coli contamination or salmonella from people crapping out in the fields. It's a little bit more egregious, but in, in dispensaries, it happens too. You know I mean? Like not everybody is as clean as you and me. And is that the type of thing where it, if it gets on there, it'll just spread like wildfire or not, not usually, but you know, if it's, It's not something you want on your, on your food. You know, I mean, it's not really like it, it's, it spreads. It just is there. It's like on the surface of the plant. And, you know, if you make edibles or smoke it, um, it's not, it's not optimal. Okay. Um, boy, we got a minute here. You, you want to do another one? I got, this is going to be great. I got a whole bunch of more questions sure. for you. If you got more time. Yeah. Cool. yeah I love well, to. Let's see. We got a minute. What can we sneak in here? I don't know. Ah, I'm gonna take it. a quick, quick break. Yeah, I'm gonna chop. I'm gonna chop it. Yeah, you take a take a bowl break. I'm gonna chop this up. I'll send you another link. We'll come back for another one here. Great stuff, Scott. Awesome.